I'm Mike Marks. I'm a moderator. I'm also a consultant, spent a fair amount of time in the industry, as many of you know. Um, I love these kinds of panels. We're gonna, I'm very excited about having the folks I've got up here. There's a lot of wisdom and experience. And we're going to go through and we're going to talk about the whole predator and prey and kind of dive into it. We'll be talking to each other. You guys can ask questions. And you may not agree with what they say. They may not even agree with each other. But the whole purpose, the whole purpose of the panel is that we talk about the industry that we all care about. It's important to all of us. And maybe you get some different perspectives. So the quick note on me, I, I'm a consultant, been a consultant for 30 years, um, have worked with a lot of the distributors in the room, you know, several of the manufacturers, and, and it's very important to me that this industry continues and goes well. Um, I, I race sports cars, uh, open wheel formula cars for fun. I'm not that good at it, and, and my nickname is Crash and Bash from the fellow racers. And, and Halsey, let's start with you. Can you tell people a little bit about yourself? Can you, Ooh, yeah, can you hear me big now? Voice. You can hear me now. Hi, Halsey Cook. I grew up in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, spent summers working in, uh, as a plumber's helper in the, um, in the downtown renewal of the Inner Harbor back in the 70s. Then I, I uh, went to um, college and went to work for Carrier United Technologies um, and worked uh, in air conditioning for 16 years. Uh, after which I uh, ran the electrical business for Legrand um, here in the U.S. Um, so I think I'm forever condemned to the mechanicals, plumbing, electrical, and ducting. Um, and uh, I love to play tennis and uh, boating as, uh, as interests. Um, sailboat or powerboat? Uh, powerboats. Okay. Dinosaurs died for you. <laughs> Bill? <laughs> Oh, thank you, Mike. Uh, Bill Mansfield. I'm with Graybar. I have been in the industry for about just over 28 and a half years. I've been at Graybar for just over 28 and a half years. I, I started uh, in, in 1987. I uh, graduated from St. Louis University with a degree in uh, computer science. And uh, in 1982, Graybar Electric had moved to St. Louis, and they all I knew about them is they had a, a building in Clayton, Missouri, which is in the suburbs. And I, I uh, uh, they also had a Honeywell mainframe as did uh, St. Louis University, where I got my undergraduate degree. So, date myself a little, we, we still use cards in the first couple of years of my program. But uh, I, I went to, to uh, this gray bar, I got sent over for an interview and, and, and uh, to be a programmer, and they told me that they really weren't interested in people who didn't have work experience, but they had a management training program, and would you be interested in doing that? And I thought about it and talked to my dad, and he said, get a job, and so. <laughs> So I said, you know, I'll do this and I'll do it in about, I bet you about a year I can get over to the IT department. And uh, so 28 and a half years later, I know where the IT department is, uh, but they've never let me go out over there and it probably worked out well. I'm not sure I would have been a great programmer. I, I would ask though, I have four children, if you ever meet any of them, please do not tell them the story. I, they're at the point of life, I want them to think that they have to have a plan uh, on where they're going. So it's great to be here and talk to you guys. <laughs> And uh, be, before we got off the boating and the dinosaur bit, um, I forgot the bit where Sonopar, my largest customer, asked me to become their president. I've done that for two years, and I'm based in Charleston, South Carolina, so. <laughs> that, that, that's important. That it's, is. it's important. And, and, and by the way, I, I think it's always exciting to have been on both sides, the manufacturer side and the distributor side, so I'm, I'm assuming that your BS filter is relatively sophisticated. Uh, yes. Yeah. Chris, how about you? Good, uh, good afternoon, Mike. Thanks for the invitation to participate in the panel. Uh, Chris Blakesley, I'm the uh, SVP and general manager of Annexter's business for North America. Uh, despite uh, what my team members at Annexter might think, uh, I actually uh, grew up thinking I wanted to be in the wire and cable business. And uh, actually, more uh, seriously, I, I originally thought law enforcement would be my career path. My dad uh, had a friend who was a bail bondsman and thought that he could break me of that by making me a bounty hunter for a summer when I was 19 years old. And uh, clearly, I didn't pursue law enforcement after uh, that uh, experience. But um, Johns Hopkins uh, University graduate, uh, actually born and raised 20 miles north of Baltimore uh, in, a, in a town named Hunt Valley. Just uh, relocated my family from Maryland to Chicago about a month ago. And uh, so uh, that transition is, has gone really well. Actually, I've been with Annexter for about three years. Uh, prior to Annexter, I uh, sort of had a, uh, two career paths. I started in manufacturing, was a manufacturing engineer for General Dynamics. 
then went to work in a strategy role for a big uh, Swedish manufacturing conglomerate named Sandvik. And then uh, having been in distribution for the second half of my career, was head of strategy for a big industrial distributor named IDG for a period of time. And uh, now with Annixter, as I said, three years, which makes me a bit of a junior in the Annixter world. We, we in the U.S. business uh, are celebrating uh, seven employees who have still been with us for 40 plus years. No kidding. Uh, average tenure in our organization is still in the teens, which considering over the, uh, with all the retirements we've had over the last couple of years is, is pretty significant. So uh, happy to be here, happy to be on the panel. Thanks again. It'll, it'll, we'll have fun. Brian? Yeah. Give the guys a little bit of background. You've got to tell them about electronics because we share that. All right, I'll, I'll do that. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Brian McNally, born in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I went to high school in Detroit um, and uh, went to college in Michigan. I also started out in uh, manufacturing, nothing to do with electrical, nothing to do with electronics, and um, uh, actually heavy-duty truck uh, parts. But I joined, um, I joined a company named Aero Electronics, and I was with them for 30 years. They're parallel industry to electrical, um, electronic component distribution. Um, it's a fascinating industry, so think about um, selling semiconductors and connectors and different components to anything electronic. Mostly, most of the products go on a, on a circuit card. So, a very interesting industry. Had a great uh, run with them. <clears throat> Eight years in uh, Europe, balance of the time in the U.S. in a variety of different roles. Uh, Halsey, I am also a boater, and given that we're both in distribution, of course, it's a power boat since uh, we don't have time for, for the sailboat. And uh, <laughs> it's uh, so it's, true. Sorry, Mike, I'm not ready. No, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> do you have a sailboat? <laughs> what? No, no, I, 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 uh, I like horsepower. Oh, you do like horsepower? I like power. a lot of horsepower. Yeah. You can never have enough horsepower. Uh, you, and I, you, and I have that, you and I have that in common. Uh, I'm with Rexel, and uh, I've been with Rexel for uh, 18 months, and uh, I think, I mean, I'm fascinated with this industry and compared to the electronic industry, in many, many ways, we're very blessed to have a large and uh, prosperous industry. So, so everybody's got different perspectives. Some of this is gonna come out in the conversation, so let's just jump right into it. This, this idea of predator or prey, there are a lot of folks that are comfortable, thought things were great, everything's going on, and, and all of a sudden, what's the old thing? Somebody moved my cheese, and, and people get upset, and they get angry. Um, and there are predators, and there's a lot of emotion around it, but, but as you guys take a look at the experience you've got, what separates the people in this crazy industry that are winning and the ones that are kind of up against the wall? I mean, what, what are the differences? First thing that comes to my mind, obviously, was the Darwinian aspects of that. So, um, you know, uh, hunt or be hunted, you know, eat, eat or be eaten type of uh, thinking. And, and of course, when you think of Darwin, you also think about change and the need to change. And um, so I think we see that play out every day in the business world as well. There's, um, you know, the famous lists of uh, top companies that no longer exist. And, you know, we know, all know the examples of companies like uh, Blockbuster that were you know, on top of the world and within 24 months or so can be wiped out by a, a change in the business model. So I think um, we're all thinking about that. I think it was an intellectual thought for distribution uh, 10 years ago. I think we're seeing real time how we need to now change in order to be uh, adaptive and competitive in this environment. Hey, hey, just jumping in on that, I think that's the, the, the ability to deal with change, to be comfortable with change, the idea that the change is not going away is really what I see is what can kind of separate the companies. I think you're right from an industry perspective. Uh, we, we've had or felt that we've had barriers to entry that kind of the change doesn't apply with us. We still talk about it. We still look at the Amazons of the world and say they can't really do what we do. Yet yet it's kind of like you're like the frog in the water. Is, is, is the water just getting hot or not? So I think, I think being able to do it just not talk about it, but to get your organization and have the leadership and the culture that, that's really comfortable with that change. But I also think uh, that really separates us, and, 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 and we all can do this differently, is really this kind of this understanding of our customers uh, and, and, and being much more customer uh, solution oriented, understanding what they go through and specializing in our customers and their businesses. The people who can do that really well, uh, find that niche and you can cover several niches as you're a large company if you're, you're an independent by yourself. You figure out what that customer is and specialize that, know that business, know their buying behaviors, know what keeps them up at night. I think that really can separate you. And Go ahead. Oh, Go sorry, ahead, Mike. Ryan. So, Bill, they, uh, I agree with you. And, you know, one other point I would add is, is the 
companies that have done it successfully, and I think about some of the electronic examples, they were very comfortable to throw away part of their service delivery model that they did very, very well, they were very comfortable with, uh, but was no longer relevant to their existing customer set. So they needed to understand exactly what their customer needed and really be in tune with that. And even if um, their old way of doing things was successful five years ago, they were very happy to pack it in yep. and start afresh because the new competition, who's not in our space, has a clean sheet of paper. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes our legacy can be a disadvantage. You know, one, one of the things that uh, we uh, talk a lot about at Annexter, and of course, our world changed relatively significantly last October when we closed on the acquisition of Power Solutions, and <clears throat> all of a sudden we got exposed very much to a different side of the industry. We had been in and around it very heavily in certain product categories for a long period of time, but to, to go from zero to 60 into what's commonly referred to as the full line electrical distribution space has been pretty insightful. And even in that business, we have, we have variation from location to location and business unit to business unit on how they think about value in their customer relationships versus just relationship. And in many cases, the, the strength of the business was predicated on long-standing person-to-person relationships between the salespeople and the customer. And that's a good thing, and it's a great foundation. But uh, this industry, you know, I've been in a few industries. This industry, I think, is one that uh, is rapidly experiencing something that others have gone through over the last two or three decades, which is if the relationship with the customer is not predicated on delivering very tangible, measurable value, if it's just the fact that they've done business with Bob for the last 20 years, it falls apart pretty quickly. And yet, when you look at the structure in the industry uh, on all fronts, including compensation, it reinforces still very much to this day that it's all about relationship and lots of individual control between the salesperson and the customer. And, uh, and I think that, that that can compromise the delivery of value if it's not kept in balance. One, one of the things I've found working with distributors is they may be very strong in, in, in big commercial construction projects or industrial, you tell you, pick something, and it's a big chunk of their business, and, and so they assume that they're strong, right? This is our core competence, and it's great. And then when you actually start to go down into it, it turns out it, it's, it's very much what you said, Chris, where they've had these sales relationships, they've done it for a quarter of a century, all their, the, the, the value is in those relationships, and those sales reps are all in their 60s, which I, being 67, I think is relatively young. Um, <laughs> But, but they're really not that strong at all. It, it's right. inertia business, and, and all this change starts to happen. And then the other thing, if, if you go back to what Halsey said, I, I am amazed at major companies that don't think about change. Mm -hmm. They're just, they, you know, they look at it as a challenge or an event, you know, and it's, it's I mean, it, if, if you think about how hard it is to actually grapple with it, mm -hmm. they, a lot of people just don't think about it because it's so unpleasant, or, or they get all wrapped up doing urgent things instead of important. We're good in this industry at doing urgent things. Well, you get you get set in your ways, and um, uh, you know I was reading an article today, uh, actually on the way in, and they're talking about uh, you know the need for wellness programs at work and things like that, and, and talking about how, uh, and and also in the article was about how Americans don't take enough vacation. And so they were saying, well, we need to start doing more at work to kind of, you know, clean our minds and bodies, and 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 um, and, and that's falling more and more on the employer to kind of take uh, responsibility for that. But their their point was is that that work becomes very much like a family sometimes, and families have routines and they have ways of doing things, and so you get set and comfortable in those those ways, and it becomes almost ritual, and it becomes tough to break out. So. Uh, to Bill's point, you know, what kind of leadership is required? I think it, it requires some disruptive leadership. You have to really hold up a mirror to the group and say, you know, look at what's going on outside and what are we going to do about that and how are we going to change and make a difference? Um, and so, you know, just as an example, we always wear kind of what I have on it to our company events. And this year, we uh, just made the invite for the big annual uh, kickoff meeting that, that we have, management meeting that we get together, we, we said, you know, wear uh, something Google-esque. And, 
you know, people showed up with three suitcases because they weren't, they had no idea what to wear, right? So, but I mean, it was just a little bit of kind of making people a little bit uncomfortable and thinking about, you know, what, uh, what might be required in terms of internal change and company-wide change in order to succeed in the future. Anybody show up on a skateboard? There was, there was some pretty wild stuff. We even had the pinwheel, you know, on the head. There you go. So.